All right. Well, this morning, like, I, to be honest with you, I thought I was going to be preaching. Uh, you can just go back to whatever. Yeah, why don't you go back to your thing, and we'll, we'll let you put the uh, scriptures up there. Um, I thought I'd be finishing up my little two-part series on the gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, I, and I, I felt like I was still going to teach on that tonight. But the Lord woke me up at about 3 o'clock this morning. And as I was just reading some scripture, the Lord put something on my heart. I realized that the 45-day the fast thing that, we had, that I had mentioned a while back is coming to an end. I think I asked Danielle the other day, well, when does it end? Because I, I, I hadn't even kept up with it. And, uh, and I think it ends uh, the 7th, which is a Wednesday. A, a Wednesday. So we can eat Wednesday or we got to wait till Thursday? That's next week, Wednesday. He can, we can eat Wednesday. Okay. And the reason I'm asking Bill is because I'm going to eat right now. All right. So, well, so just, but anyway, so the point is, is that as I started to study, the, the, the thought of fasting came to my mind. And I know that Bill recently taught on that. I'm not going to try to repeat. I'm going to, I'm going to try to share with you what the Lord put on my heart tonight. Okay, about that. So there's another week left of this 45-day fast. Um, now, what we what felt like the Lord put on our heart, we did it the last time, was that we would, if people, whoever could, or whoever wanted to, or whoever felt led to, would join us in a corporate fast from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Amen? And then you could eat before 6, you could eat after 6, one of the things, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. And it really isn't whenever you're doing it for about two weeks. But to be honest with you, about three to four weeks in, I started to kind of get a little, like, I want to eat lunch. I went, one time I went to a restaurant. I'm not trying to, y'all already know I'm fasting, so I'm not that bragging about fasting because you're not supposed to do that. But I'm just trying to make a point. One time we went to a restaurant on a Thursday afternoon, and I was going to eat. And it was about 5.30. And I said, you know what? I think I'm going to wait 30 minutes. I'm going to try to make a point to you tonight, and I hope that the point is communicated. And somebody even at the table might have said, come on, man. I said, no, it's not about legalism. It's about the fact that the Lord called me to a fast, and that by the grace of God, I want to be faithful to that fast. Okay? And the Lord put that on my heart. Praise God. And so what I asked everybody to do, and so we're going to kind of talk about it tonight a little bit. I think before it's all said and done, I hope I can at least share my heart why I would think that the Lord would even want us to fast. There's a lot of different examples in the Bible about fasting. But where I started, can you go to First First uh, Corinthians 9 and uh, 24? And we'll read First Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. This is kind of where it started for me this morning. Uh, how I ended up, I can't remember the whole process of how it ended up with with fasting, but anyway, uh, I'm just going to share with you the things that the Lord said. So this is what the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. In other words, you're gonna, if you're in in a race, you're going to try to win you're not going into a race to lose. You're going to try to win. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Uh, I got the NASB up here. Uh, it says in verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. So temperance and self-control is, is the same concept, the same word. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I. Now the word in the NASB uses the word box, like boxing. I think that that's actually more appropriate, and I'll share it to you in a moment why I believe that to be the case. He says that, that we don't fight. He says, I fight not as one that beats the air, but I keep my body under, I keep under my body. In the, in the NASB, it says, um, they, uh, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body. Now, listen, don't put words in my mouth before and don't turn me off because you think I'm pre preaching words. I'm, I'm just saying I'm asking you. Nice. Please don't turn me off because you think I'm preaching the words of this message because works 
victory for, through works is false doctrine. Right. And I'm not preaching false doctrine. I'm preaching the truth. I'm, pre I'm reading right here the Apostle Paul's writing. This is the great Apostle Paul right here. He says, this is how it's worded in the NASB. I don't uh, fight, run in such a way as without aim. I box not in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body. Look at this. And I make it my slave. Yeah. I discipline my body and I make it my slave. In, in the King James, he says, I keep, my, I keep under my body, bring it into subjection, yeah. lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he said, I'm making my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now, the idea, the reason I believe that boxing is better is that one of those words in there, and you can go back and you can do the research if you have the little olive tree app or you have a Strong's Concordance, but one of them talks about being beaten black and blue. Now, we're not, and it actually talks about a jab specifically under the eye. In the Greek language, that's what the idea is, to jab up under the eye. So what, he, what he's using is a, a picture of a gladiator Likely, you know, sometimes people will shadow box. But look, when once a gladiator got in the ring, all the all the practice is over, my friend. Right. If you know anything about Roman history, once they got into into the Colosseum or wherever they were going, usually, uh, the best of my understanding, it was a fight to the death. Yeah. The Word of God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against world rulers, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So the idea is, is that whenever he's getting boxed and he's bringing his body under submission, the idea is talking about a jab that's turning you black and blue and it's right there under the eye. I don't know a lot about fighting, but one thing that I do know is this. A jab is a powerful weapon. Yep. You know why? Because as soon as somebody thinks that they're coming in and you jab them and you keep stinging them, it makes them, you know what it does? It starts to wear the other person down. They don't like getting jabbed. They don't like getting stung in the face. It starts to wear them down. And it, you know what it does? It starts to mess with their head. It starts to mess with their head and it starts to mess with their endurance. And I'm here to tell you tonight, my friend, the battlefield of life, when it comes to walking for the Lord, when it comes to living for Jesus, endurance is extremely important yeah. in the walk of God, in the war that we are in, in the spiritual warfare that you and I are engaged in. Mental tenacity. What does that mean? Mental toughness is extremely important in our walk to, to live in this life. Listen, we live in the midst of a society. I don't, I'm not trying to fuss about society, but I'm just going to call it. Everybody gets a trophy now. Yep. Yeah. Everybody gets a trophy. Nobody ever gets bad grades. Right. And, and I'm sorry, that's not reality. That's right. The reality is, is that not everybody wins. Yeah. And, and don't please don't offend me. And, and now we live in a world where people don't have any kind of endurance. They have no mental tonight. The world is medicated, man. The whole world is medicated. Yeah. Nobody can even help us, Lord. Right. Help us. I'm telling you the truth. And, and people are finding ways to try to calm the pain and the chaos in the midst of their lives. And they're turning everywhere other than to Jesus. And you know the word wrestle right there literally means to throw somebody down. And the victor wins by being able to hold his hand on the neck of his opponent. Yeah. That's what the enemy wants to do to you and I. He wants to wear us down. He wants to come in with his jabs. He wants to come in, you know, from the right to the left. He wants to hit you in your family. He wants to hit you with your children. He wants to hit you at work. He wants to hit you in your finances. He wants to hit you in your health. He wants to keep on jabbing. He wants to keep on pummeling. And people would ask the question, why would God allow such a thing to happen? Well, listen, I'm just here to tell you right now, part of God's work in our lives is that he chases those whom he loves. I'm not here to tell you that God's putting sickness on people. God is not the author of sickness. I'm not even here to tell you that God is tempting you with evil. The Word of God says that God doesn't tempt people with evil. But that whenever we're tempted or tested, what happens is this. We start to find out that the thing that we're dealing with was already in us. That's right. The Word of God, and it's lust that's found in us. Lust, what does that mean? It means a desire for something you're not supposed to have or want. It doesn't always mean fornication. 
It means an evil desire, or it could be a good desire, but in this context, an evil desire for something, anything yes. that you're not supposed to want. That's or right. for the child of God, for he that knows to do right, but he doesn't do it for him, it is sin. What about that? <laughs> for he who knows to do right, but doesn't do it, for him it is sin. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Hallelujah. And so I just want to kind of share some of that with you that the enemy, he wants to start trying to break us down. Who is going to be the victor, Satan? I'll put that in my notes. Who is going to win the battle? Is it going to be them or is it going to be us? Who's going to win the battle in the end when it's all said and done? Amen. Hallelujah. We are. I'm talking about you, though, as individuals right now while you're in the midst of the battle. I want to try to encourage you. I want to let you know God's on your side. If God be for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. The Holy Spirit is here to help you. He's here to give you the victory. But we got it. This is the next word I put. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's the Spirit's fruit, but it's the self-cooperating with the Spirit. Is this not the case with all the Spirit's fruit? Does God not require the vessel of self to joint participate with the prompting of the Spirit? Does not God require self to joint participate with the Holy Spirit. If Jesus, listen, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let, let me just keep going. In order for the harvest of fruit to become a reality in our life, on paper, it's already done. Yes. I guarantee you right now, if you'll sit here and flip through these pages, we can sit here and I can draw it on the board for you. Right? I can draw it. Why don't we do it? Let's draw it on the board. We've drawn it for, for eight years. This is you, born in Adam, right? You're dead. Your scoliosis, you're crooked. That's what the Word of God says. A, wick, a perverse, a perverse generation. The word is crooked. Also translated as crooked. The word in the Greek is scolios, where we get scoliosis. You got. You was born in Adam, and you were born dead in sin. Yeah. Crooked. You're, you were born with a sinful nature. Okay, but good news, good news. Man, God got a good plan, my friend. Yes, God has a beautiful plan. He, listen, he done called Abraham out of Iraq and said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And through the nation that he made, he gave the world Jesus. And in Jesus, he's making the church. And you're part of the church. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, then, and so he gave us Jesus. And so now in the New Testament, this is his crown of thorns, right? Now in the New Testament, see, it takes faith. Faith in Jesus, the miracle worker. Yes. Jesus, the great teacher. The Savior. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, the healer. Yeah, he healed your disease. 